Thank you, Sarkis, for, uh, the, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation as well. I've been following this uh, symposium with great interest um, and I'm looking forward to the, the next uh, six weeks of it, uh, I think. So I'm going to kind of riff a little bit on some of the things that you've already heard about, um, particularly from Dan Geshwin, and talk about some of the gene discovery in autism and, and where it might be going. So uh, a few, a couple of years ago, I got up in front of a, 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 an audience that was largely biotech and pharma, and I introduced a new rare syndrome called Mizuyaf syndrome. And Mizuyaf syndrome had these characteristics. It was, the cause was unambiguous and uncontested. There's a very easy and accurate test for the syndrome. There's very high convergence, which means if the test was positive, you get the syndrome. There are cell and animal models with very high construct validity. In other words, they seem to reflect the actual biology of the disorder. There's good preclinical evidence uh, from mouse models that if you reduce, reduce the causal deficit, you will get recovery even later in life. Um, the, it's a rare disorder, but it's not ultra rare. So uh, it could get orphan designation, which is important. And um, you know, there's, a, there's likely to be a good target, uh, target group. There's a very engaged family foundation and registries of patients. There are many, alt there are expert sites that can that actually see these patients and can um, think about clinical endpoints. The FDA is very supportive with these rare disorders. Um, <clears throat> and if the drug is successful, there's a reasonable path to take that drug just like they do in cancer and try it for a related disorder. So I presented this and I said, if I, if this, you know, what, what would be the interest of biotech and pharma today uh, with such a disorder? And literally everybody in the audience said, this is, this is what we're looking for. This is what we need right now. This is what biotech and pharma are interested in. Um, and if you could show us such a disorder, then um, we, would, uh, we would be all over it. So that was good news. Uh, I'll, I'll come to the punchline in the end. So, um, you know, Dan talked a little bit about uh, different kinds of genetic um, variants. And I like to think about genetic variants into breaking down into the frequency of the variant, whether it's rare or common, and whether the effect size is high or low. And I'm primarily gonna be talking about things that are sort of over here, rare things that have high effect. Okay, that in other words, when the, as I said, kind of intimated before, if there's a mutation in, in this particular rare gene, it's gonna have a likely chance, a very likely chance of having a phenotype. And um, as Dan also mentioned within the autism uh, framework, <clears throat> most genetic risks for autism are common inherited variants. So these are variants of tiny effect, uh, but there's a non-trivial amount of variants that are um, variants of major effect that are de novo or rare inherited or non-additive um, that might account for up to about 20% of autism so far. So I'm gonna focus on these, uh, these kind of 20% of autism, if you will. In other words, like I said, in a, mo a moment ago, right up here. And I'll focus on some work <clears throat> that's been going on for over a decade um, from the Autism Sequencing Consortium. And other groups are doing this equally well. Uh, the Autism Sequencing Consortium um, it integrates all available data. And so I'm actually reflecting the data from the field, not just the ASC. And the ASC uh, came about because there were many, many samples throughout the world, autism samples, DNA samples that had been collected, but had not been sequenced. So they had been studied in certain kinds of genetic tests. But again, as Dan mentioned, there's new methodologies that are relatively inexpensive, comparatively speaking. And if we could apply them to all available samples, it could in principle be transformative. And this is just, again, to say the same thing that, you know, this is the paper that, that we had coming out early in this year. And you can see that uh, Costa Rica, this is a, ma a massive initiative, um, Autism Sequencing Consortium, Sweden, Germany, Japan, Spain, all these samples were available for sequencing and processing Germany. And we included the Simon Simplex collection and the iSight collection as well. So again, we generate our own data, but through collaborations, we access other people's data and we try and put it all together. Um, a lot of people, there's hundreds of people on the paper. These are people just in the writing committee. And the, and the paper came out early this year. It's uh, already out of date. Um, 
as is the nature of uh, science these days, things move so quickly. But here's some of the take homes. There are 102 genes that we think are uh, implicated in autism so far. Um, they're expressed uh, early uh, in development as Dan actually mentioned as well. And they're expressed both in excitatory and inhibitory pathways. I'll come back to that. And there's kind of um, two main classes that Dan also mentioned, synapse, uh, synaptic genes and things that regulate other genes. And then um, there are some kind of, some genes that seem to afflict, uh, affect neurodevelopment broadly and some that are more restricted to the autism phenotype. Okay, so this is what we call the Manhattan plots, a little bit different than the ones most people see most of the time because here we're actually measuring specific genes rather than regions of the genome. But each one of these um, multi-letter names are the names of genes. And every gene above any one of these lines uh, would have, very, have strong or very strong evidence for implicated, being implicated in autism. So you just heard, for example, about uh, Shank3, that's the gene over here. So Shank3 is on chromosome 22, and clearly uh, when mutated, increases the risk for autism, but there are many other genes like that. There's about probably 15 or 20 that are really, really major effect genes that are pretty, pretty common for rare genes. Okay. And then there are many more that are just now coming up. So we have these 102 genes with more to be discovered. And let me go back here so I can advance it. And um, the genes, these 102 genes fall broadly into a couple of major categories, gene expression regulation, genes that, ex that regulate other genes, and then genes that are involved in synaptic function and neuronal communication. And here's that shank three again. Genes that are involved in the cytoskeleton, also mentioned by Dan, and some other genes that we didn't, we couldn't bend quite so easily. So the first question is, you know, to the question of whether these are all somehow related, are these genes over here in purple, are, there, are, are they making their effect through regulating these genes? Wouldn't that be nice that these are not two classes of genes, but one, but these are the main class and these genes act by regulating these genes. This is a complicated slide, but the short story is that that is not the case, that these genes, however they cause autism and developmental delay, their primary mechanism of action does not seem to be simply the regulation of these genes over here. So there's kind of, you know, we, we're looking for convergence as Dan said, but um, this isn't the point of convergence. And um, you heard also that, you know, th that, uh, these genes tend to map in certain periods of, of, of fetal development, right? And um, if this is time, these, these are different kinds of cells that are, that are uh, invo involved in developing the excitatory nerve cells and the inhibitory nerve cells, the glutamatergic and GABAergic primarily. And each cluster is a different kind of cell. And this axis over here shown with these arrows is time, okay? So, and, and this, so on this side, you see what's red are where these autism genes are being expressed and blue, they're not being expressed so much. So what you can see is that there is a transition from uh, at some point during development where these genes are beginning to express very highly in, in many different cell types, uh, but they're both in the excitatory and in the inhibitory lineage. So we heard about EI balance, or excitatory inhibitory balance in autism. It's not one or the other. Either way, changing either one of these major cell types and probably other ones as well can lead to autism. So it's, we can't simplify it either to a specific cell type. Um, I'll come back to this, but this is some of the good news. We have enough mutations in these various genes that we're finding that we can begin to actually say something very thoughtful about the mechanism, how the mutation works, at least on a, on a first pass level. Another bit of good news with these very large samples is that we can now also begin to look at uh, structural variants, genomic disorders that we knew about for many, many years and begin to understand in a genomic disorder, there's often many genes that are uh, disrupted. 
but maybe only a few of those many genes are contributing to the phenotype. So this whole region of 2Q37.3, a part of chromosome two, has been implicated in a genomic disorder. We're now showing that the primary driver is not all these other genes, which are just shown um, kind of schematically, but primarily this HDLBP. So uh, we're beginning to kind of zoom in on genomic disorders to understand mechanisms. So there's good news, but the complicated news is, as I said before, that they don't all, so far, they don't all map neatly into a single mechanism. While the work in autism has been going on in the autism community, there have been many studies that look more broadly at developmental disorders. And many of these studies are very early in life. So these might be kids who are failing to thrive, showing motor abnormalities. So they may not even be at an age where you can measure IQ or autism, but you can, you can see something developmental is happening. And a, a very important consortium called the DDD, Deciphering Developmental Disorder Study, has been doing something very similar to what I described for a long time as well, but now focusing on broader developmental delay syndromes. And this is the same kind of plot that I showed you a moment ago, all right? And importantly, if you look at the plot side by side, you'll immediately notice that some of the same genes, here's ADMP in autism, ADMP in developmental delay, SYNGAP1, a major gene in developmental delay, SYNGAP1, a major gene in autism, uh, DDX3X, a major gene in developmental delay, Dan Gashman was the first to show it's a major gene in autism as well. Um, so we're finding overlapping genes between autism samples collected because of an autism diagnosis and samples collected for broader developmental disorders. Uh, and if you put that data together, and I'll kind of jump ahead right now, if you put in the newest DDD data and the newest ASC data, which I'll talk about briefly, we now have a combination of about 300 genes that actually all look kind of the same. Genes of major effect, um, not terribly rare, and so on and so forth. And when you look at those genes, even if they're found in both populations, you can see differences in individuals with autism uh, if they have a mutation in the genes that are more found in the developmental delay population or genes that are more found in the autism population, though you'll see changes in the phenotype. How, how, what age will the child walk? What is their full scale IQ on average? So what we're saying is that some of these genes seem to be more specific to autism and some of them broadly affect general cognition, general, general developmental delay and social cognition. So that's another bit of good news. We can now begin to kind of attach flavors to different genes to understand the spectrum of phenotypes that are associated. Okay, and then I said the work I showed you is already out of date. Um, a wonderful effort from the Simons Foundation uh, called Spark has now released and made its data available, and we've incorporated that. They've had their own publication coming out um, with uh, thousands of trios with autism spectrum disorder, and putting together what we now call ASC3, the ASC data I showed you, the Simon Simplex collection data from the iPsych pages and Spark, we now have twice as many cases, and this was just presented um, to, uh, last week, um, where we now have twice as many genes that are autism genes. And, whoops, uh, and this is kind of the history of the, of the ASC and other studies like the Simon Simpox collection. And then um, this is the 2020 paper. And then we already have a new paper that'll come out from a, a kind of a collaborative study between the Simons Foundation and the ASC that will double again the number of autism genes. And while all this is going on, the DDD uh, has a new paper coming out as well that has uh, incorporated two other massive sample sets and has even more genes that are involved in intellectual disability, developmental delay, motor delay, and so on. And again, some of those genes overlap very strongly with autism genes. So in terms of the discovery side, we could not be doing any better. I mean, it's just going amazingly well. We've gone from having you know, very few insights into the molecular biology and molecular genetics of autism to having literally a you know, couple of hundred genes for autism uh, with looser criteria, three to 400 for developmental delay that overlap extensively. You can put all of that together and come up with a, a very, very compelling list of over 200 genes with very strong evidence for being mutated in autism cases.
Okay, so that brings us to precision medicine, which was mentioned before as well, where if you have a disorder and you can understand etiology, you can capture a cause of that disorder in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effective way. Then you can recreate that causal variant mutation, for example, in either stem cells or in rodent models and, and study pathophysiology. This is a synapse, a connection between two brain cells. And that's hard to study in human beings. It's easy to study in, in, in laboratory animals. And so understanding pathophysiology and pathobiology can lead to drug development and novel therapeutics so that you could then um, move forward into clinical trials. And so when I think about classic drug discovery, we're not talking about some of the broader approaches, for example, the microbiome, uh, circuitry-based interventions, um, obviously behavioral interventions, people don't really care when they're giving somebody with autism a behavioral intervention, what the cause of the autism is, right? They're doing a top-down approach, okay? If you're, if you're enhancing social behaviors, as you just heard from the prior talk, that's top-down. Gene discovery and drug development from that side is bottom up. And so my question I wanna kind of address briefly is with all these discoveries, do we have any alternative but to consider precision medicine? Okay, so I will go through this. Maybe it's better um, if I show you slide by slide rather than, um, I'll come back to this. So I showed you two examples from the ASC that said that with all the genes we're finding, it's not a single pathway. Some of them are excitatory, some of them are inhibitory, some of them are drug uh, are regulating other genes, some of them are synaptic it's not yet converging in a tight way into certainly not one pathway. Um, ideally, someday it'll converge into 10 pathways, but right now we're not there yet. Um, this is an important point from the slide I kind of went through rather quickly. I said, we're learning more and more about, we're seeing so many mutations, we're collecting so many mutations in each gene that we're beginning to understand mechanisms. And what you can see is that most genes that we're finding have mutations that are called protein truncating variants. Um, some of them have no missense. So the gene is basically lost. What that means is that most of the findings we're making right now for a variety of reasons are loss of function. The gene was there and now it's gone. And that turns out to be important and I'll come back to that in a moment. Another thing we've known in, in the brain sciences but certainly in genetics now more and more is that um, these genes that we're talking about are very, very tightly regulated in terms of their amount. That's why when you lose some, you get a phenotype. But it also means that when you add too much, you can get a, a phenotype too. Usually not as bad, um, but certainly the case. So they're U-shaped curves. So you can't just put more and more and more and more and more and hope for the best, right? You have to kind of tighter it. This is shank three. This is a very, uh, this is a finding that actually occurs in Phelan McDermott syndrome, where there's a balanced translocation in a parent. And so within the family, based on that balanced translocation, you can get uh, monosomy, sorry, monosomy, disomy, and trisomy. You can get the regular two copies of shank three or one copy of shank three, which is the syndrome you've heard about or you can get three copies of shank three where you have a lesser phenotype. This individual has Asperger's and some other things in gray. Um, and this is the person with a classic Phelan McDermott syndrome. So there are, quite a, there, there are several families with this and we know it over and over again. Too little is bad, too much is not good. Never as bad as too little, generally speaking. All the disorders I'm talking about, these gen genetic disorders, they tend to be very severe. This is shank three again. This is from some of our work. Um, most meet criteria for autism. Look at the IQ distribution in these individuals that we first saw, more severe um, than, than what we see nowadays. But what you can see is that um, profound intellectual disability, more than 50%, severe, another 25%. Uh, and so, those genomic, those genetic disorders I'm talking about tend to be very severe. This is, a, a, again, sticking to Shank 3, um, a study that's been done in, with many of these genes where they turn the gene back on in a mouse at different times during development. And this paper uh, showed very clearly that even turning the gene back on in adult mice 
rescues some of the phenotypes, not all of them, but some of them. There are some caveats uh, and then another paper that showed it again. So the caveats are slightly uh, addressed, but this is not the only example. In mice, and again, um, thank you tomorrow for the prior, the prior talk showing that mice, it's a good time to be a mouse with autism. Um, in mice, turning these genes back on tends to be beneficial even later in life. Okay. And I said that these, all these genes we're talking about at the top of that graph, all those graphs, tend to be relatively common. These are the four that we study, DDX3, X, Shank3, ADMP, and FOXP1. I don't know why FOXP1 is not on there. Um, and all of them are in the kind of, and I think Dan showed this as well, half a percent, one percent of autism, half a percent, one percent of intellectual disability. So they're orphan disorders, but there's a fairly significant population. And they're highly penetrant. Um, this is an analysis we did in the prior ASC paper showing odds ratios between 20 and 70. What that means is a mutation in this gene is 20 to 70 times more likely to produce an autism phenotype than, in an, than if you don't have a mutation. And on average, the top genes are in the 50 to 80, well, let's say 50 fold odds ratio, 20 to 50, 20 to 70. Um, which basically means for those individuals, this is contributing most of the risk for their autism. Okay, this is what I just kind of summarized now. Not a single pathway, overwhelmingly dominant, which means that uh, there are two alleles, two, 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 two copies of a gene, and one of them is mutated. So there's a second healthy allele that can be manipulated. So there's a way for biotech and pharma and maybe academia too, to think about a platform. How do we upregulate the second allele for many of these disorders? Primarily loss of function. Again, you just, so then if one copy of the gene is gone, then you just have to focus on the other one, maybe make more of it. That's one strategy. Can show a U-shaped curve, so we have to be careful about too much. Tend to be severe, so there's a huge unmet need. And as I said, in multiple animal models, it's been shown that you turn the gene back on, you get recovery. They are, quote, fairly common rare disorders, and they're highly penetrant, right? So again, the, the mutation causes most of the phenotype. So let's come back to Mizuyoff syndrome. For each of these genes, and let's say there's 250 right now between autism, intellectual disability, and development to delay and epilepsy, the cause is unambiguous and uncontested, okay? Somebody has epilepsy and has an SNC2A mutation, you know the cause of their epilepsy. There is an easy and accurate test for this syndrome. It's genetic testing. There's high conversion. In other words, if you have a mutation, you're likely to have a phenotype. Because of this, because there is such high conversion, when you mutate, if you take human cells and culture from patients, or you engineer them, or you engineer a mouse with a mutation like the shank 3 b it has construct validity. It does reflect some of the biology that you see, you expect to see in, in patients. Good preclinical evidence that reversing the causal deficit will lead to improvements, as I showed you, at least for Shank 3. Relatively rare, but not vanishingly rare. They will get an orphan designation. For each of those genes, almost without exception that I kind of flash by, there are family foundations with registries of hundreds of patients. Expert sites that actually look at the patients and can actually do clinical trials and can identify endpoints. And the FDA is very supportive for these orphan disorders, works closely with families, has been very flexible about endpoints and indications. And they also offer to biotech and pharma something called a priority review voucher if they take on a rare disorder like this, which can be worth 50 to $100 million to that company. So uh, there's incentives, massive incentives, not only the ones you know about, but additional incentives to get involved in, the, in this or these syndromes, okay? And this is where, you know, I think um, the, the, the example of cancer and, and kind of reflecting back on Dan's talk where Dan was talking about convergence. Here I am saying there ain't no convergence. Well, I think there is convergence, but I think that what we can do today is precision medicine for these rare disorders when you think about drug discovery from that side. But if a drug is successful, there's a reasonable way to pivot and try it in some other related autism disorder, right? So just like in cancer, you know, a company might come up with a new treatment for a very specific subtype of cancer. Once it's approved, 
it's much easier given all the safety data and the fact that it's available and compounded and the road administration is known, it's much easier. And it's, there's been some complaints about this as you probably know, to then say, okay, now I'm gonna use it for this other rare cancer and get another orphan designation for it. The controversy is of course, because um, the cost to, to, to repurposing is, is relatively small compared to the initial cost. But I, be, I fully believe that they will be convergent mechanisms. I don't think we're there yet, but for me, the best way to, the next best step in terms of classic drug discovery is targeting these rare disorders. And then as we find things that work, expand into other uh, condition, uh, other autisms that don't have exactly the same mutation. So I think I kind of gave it away already. Muzoyaf syndrome doesn't exist. Uh, Muzoyaf is Hebrew for fake or made up. Um, but I hope I've convinced you that there are literally hundreds of neurodevelopmental disorder syndromes, all at least half of which we already know increases for autism and probably most of them do that have most of these properties that I showed you before that I presented to the biotech and pharma world. And they said, show me that disorder and I will invest heavily in it. And I, so at the end of the talk, I said, okay, so I've just shown you, you know, at that time it was a hundred genes. And I reminded them that a few years ago we had shown them 10 genes and five genes and nine genes. And at no time did a great number of them jump on this. And um, I think that's changing now. I think at this point, biotech and pharma are realizing that this really is really are kind of, can be conceptualized as classic orphan disorders and they can make inroads into the autism spectrum. We do a lot in this space at the Cyber Autism Center. Um, like I said, you, I think, I, I hope I convinced you that we know the top genes for autism and developmental disorders. You've heard um, from both from the organizer and from Dan about using human neurons, actually growing human cells in dishes that can be used for assays for screening drugs. You've heard a lot now about animal models and how they can be used to test things like social behavior and uh, you know the microbiome. And then, um, as I said, lots of sites do a lot of work with some of these rare disorders. And so, for example, in the, in the Seber Center. We're very involved in gene discovery. We've made for our four genes, we have extensive human neurons. For all of our four genes, we have extensive rodent models. And for all of our four genes we study, we see patients uh, with those mutations, right? And so, you know, in terms of drug discovery and development, we can think about, um, we know the targets. If we could develop robust cellular assays for screening, uh, you know, we could, test human neurons in culture, as you've already heard, screen 200,000 compounds, try and find drugs, uh, look more at those human neurons to kind of to convince ourselves that it's actually working the way we want it to. If it does work, then we can go to some of these animal models. Again, if that does work, then we have to do something over here, uh, some magic called medicinal chemistry to be able to push into a clinical trials. So academia has doing a great job with these four things in my opinion. The gaps that academia is facing are these, are, you know, are, are two big ones and, and, and many small ones. The first gap is having a target and having some cells is great, but making highly robust uh, high throughput screens, most academic sites don't do that very well. Conversely, this is what pharma does and biotech does uh, best. This is, this is where they've been for decades. Not to say that some academic sites aren't doing a great job. And of course the NIH is getting involved in this too, but the, a lot of the strength in the gap that's between having a target and then having a screen is, is screen development and biotech and pharma are excellent at that. And then over here, when you have a lead compound that you're very convinced about the medicinal chemistry again, is really, really the bailiwick of um, pharma and biotech. Again, not to say that there aren't some exceptionally good academic sites that are doing this very well, but it's what biotech and pharma do all the time. And so, and I, th and I, I wanna thank the organizer for mentioning this, you know, the, the, the critical part, the place what we are in terms of drug discovery and development in autism really is, when you think about classic drug discovery and development, how to 
engage academia and industry as partners? Like, what are the models that can really do that? Because, I, you know, for just about every gene at the top of those lists, I can I can tell you um, who's working on it from the academic side. Uh, what what are the what's the family foundations? How many patients are known out there? What's the evidence that it's a strong target? What animal models exist? What stem cell models exist? Um, and so a lot of what pharma does not do well, pharma typically does not interact extensively with families and, and patients at, at, at early stages, has not historically at least done a lot of um, gene discovery. The things that academia does well, uh, we've come a long way and we need to all figure out collectively, how can we best put this all together uh, so that the entire community, right? Uh, clinical, academic, family, industry, work together to kind of make this, to fill these gaps and make a single flow that, as I said, could be platform. It could be a way of saying, let's not look at one gene, let's look at 50 genes at a time. Okay, so I wanna thank you. The Zebra Center um, is, is a big group uh, because uh, they, there are people who work on the clinical side, the preclinical side, the animals, the stem cells. Um, and uh, great pleasure to be here, and I'm very happy to present um, some of our thinking um, from the ASC and from the Zebra Center. So, thank you. Joseph, thank you for really an enlightening talk, both in terms of breadth and depth in uh, the genetics of autism. So we're over time oh, sorry. a little bit. I just want to squeeze one quick question in um, from the audience. Uh, which reads, what explains the remaining 80% of autism? Do you think that's of genetic origin primarily as well? Yeah, um, the, the, you know, you've heard from Dan and from me that, we, that heritability in autism is close to 80%. So much of autism is genetic, but a lot of the genetics are these common variants of, uh, of small effect. So much of autism is genetic, but only part of autism is caused by these mutations. Much of autism is caused by genetic variants that we all share. So you and I, Sarkis, have you know, a, a reasonable percentage of autism variants in our genetics. We just have, don't have so many that we manifest with the syndrome, right? So getting a handle on those common variants these of, of minor effect is much more difficult. But there's excellent work uh, going on in autism and, and even more so in schizophrenia with as many more of these already known. So that's the next thing. That's the future. 